through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Have you ever had significant doubts about something significant in your life? Uh, maybe you've had a decision that you have to make. You can't avoid making dis- a decision, but you have significant doubts either way you go. Uh, recently, I read several testimonies of men who had significant doubts about getting married, and they ended up not even showing up at the altar. And allegedly, these testimonies are real. I'm just going to read you a couple here. Uh, the first one is, is by a man named Rob. He's 24 years old. He says, all my guys were still single, and I was going to be the only one with a wife. It just seemed like too much too soon. I decided to back out. Yes, I backed out last minute, like 12 minutes before the wedding time. But I just realized after sitting down and thinking about it that married life wasn't for me. Or Clyde, he was 32 years old at the time. He said, man, it stunk to realize this at the final hour. But right before it was time for the ceremony to start, I, I just got hit with a wave of realization that the person I was about to marry wasn't the right person for me. She just wasn't it. I was settling. Weddings are expensive. I knew that. But divorce would be more expensive. It took me 15 minutes to realize this. Then I ran out of the place. We never spoke again. And as you've learned, doubting is just part of the human experience. It's just part of the basic human experience. And the way I would describe doubt is to say that doubting is wavering between certainty and uncertainty. I'm going to marry her. No, I'm not going to marry her. No, I'm going to marry her for sure. No, I'm not going to marry her. And throughout the years, I've spoken with hundreds of people who have had significant doubts about significant things in their lives. I've talked with people who have had doubts about all kinds of things, and I feel like just through my experience in my life and talking to a lot of people, there are two really basic things that I think you need to think about as we dive into Psalm 73 when it comes to doubt. And the first thing is this, is that doubts about significant things tend to have, or I'm sorry, doubts about insignificant things tend to have an insignificant impact on your life. This means that all doubts are not the same. Not all doubts have the same impact in your life. Like this week, I was reading this story about this woman who allegedly had a service peacock she wanted to take on the plane with her. And here's a picture of the peacock. She's trying to, you know, go through uh, the airline, and and they stopped her, and they wouldn't let her take the peacock. And so I, I read about this. I looked into it. I looked at a bunch of pictures. And as I studied it, I thought, this smells like a prank to me. This smells like, like a dare, and I, I just wasn't, I wasn't buying it. I doubt whether or not this is a legitimate thing. Now, you might look into this and say, no, this is for sure real. You know, I see service peacocks all the time or whatever, and you're thinking, no, this is a real thing. This is a genuine thing. This is no prank at all. I just doubt it. Now, if you doubt, or if I doubt that this is real, but you're convinced that this is real, it will make no functional difference in our lives. It will not impact the trajectory of our lives at all. If I doubt this is a real thing, it's not going to impact how I, Im- how I raise my kids. It's not going to impact what I do with my money. It's not going to impact my relationships. It's not going to impact how I follow Christ. And so doubting something that is insignificant tends to have an insignificant in- impact on your life. But doubts about significant things tend to have a significant impact on your life, like getting married. If you have major doubts 12 minutes before you get married, that is painful any way you go. If you move forward with major doubts right before your wedding, that is a very hard thing to do. Or if you call off the wedding 12 minutes before the ceremony is supposed to begin, that is a painful thing to do. It has a large impact on your life. Or if you have doubts about your career, or doubts about what you're going to study in college, or doubts about how you're going to raise your kids, 
These things impact the trajectory of your life. These doubts mess with the fabric of your life, how you experience life itself. And when we come to Psalm 73, we find a man having significant doubts about the most significant area of life. He is doubting whether or not it is worth it to continue following the Lord. This is what he's wrestling with. He says, I have one life to live, just like you. You have one life to live. What will you give your life to? And this is a man who had been walking with the Lord, who had been obeying the Lord, and he got to a point where he said, is it actually worth it to continue following the Lord? And through Asaph's experience in Psalm 73, Asaph wrote Psalm 73, through his experience in Psalm 73, we're going to learn three things about doubt. Here they are. First is the nature of doubt. Number two is the reason we doubt. And number three is what to do when we doubt. So let's look at the first one, the nature of doubt. Verse one says, God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. Now there are three things to notice about the nature of doubt from these first two verses. First is that doubt is the conflict between Asaph's brain and his soul. What is doubt? Like, when it comes to doubting whether or not you're going to follow the Lord or doubting the things of God, oftentimes what it comes down to is this. It's, it's the conflict between what you know in your brain and what you experience in your soul. Look at verse 1. He says, God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. This is a truth Asaph would have learned from childhood. As a little kid, he would have grown up learning the truth that God is good, that God is good to Israel. That God is good to those who are pure in heart. And if you've grown up in the church, you've learned this truth as well. There's a famous saying, uh, and it goes like this. You probably heard it. God is good all the time and all the time. How does, God is good. You've, you've learned that you probably your, or you've heard that probably your whole life if you've grown up in a church. But see, this is the very truth that is being challenged. Is God really good to Israel? Is God really good to the pure in heart? So in verse 1, he's saying, this is what I know to be true. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are, who are pure in heart. Verse 2, but as for me, he had a different experience. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. He says, I'm not walking in that truth, the truth of the goodness of God. I'm not experiencing that truth that God is surely good to Israel. That's not what I'm experiencing right now. I know that, that this is true in my mind, but I'm not experiencing it in my life. And this is the foundation of most of our doubts as we try to walk with the Lord. It is the conflict between what I know in my mind and what I experience in my soul. The second thing to notice about the nature of doubt is that doubt is a miserable experience for Asaph. Doubt is a miserable experience. Like when you have to make a decision about what you're gonna do with your life, what you're gonna do with the Lord, and you have significant doubts, it is a miserable experience. This is where he's at in verse 13. He says, did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? This is what he's doubting. Is it worth it to obey God? Does it really pay off? Is it really worth the sacrifice? He says, because it feels like vanity to actually obey God, because it is hard to purify your heart. It's hard to wash your hands in innocence. It's not actually hard, or it's not actually an easy thing to obey God. It is a very challenging thing. And I think if you've ever come face to face with what the Lord Jesus requires of you, you you've looked at the Word of God and you've come face to face with what Jesus is asking you to do, I'm sure you've doubted. And if you've never gone through a season of doubting about whether or not you're going to follow Christ, it's probably because you don't know what Jesus is asking of you. You probably don't actually, you've never considered it. But when you come face to face with what the Lord Jesus is asking of each one of us, he, he says you must deny yourself and take up a cross and follow me. Wow, that means your whole life is different and how you make all your decisions is totally different. It's a hard thing to do, to do the right thing in the moment. Oftentimes it is much harder to do the right thing. You know, this last week I ordered a pair of shoes from Amazon, uh, but they didn't fit. And so I returned them. And when Amazon uh, refunded me the money, they gave me twice as much back. 
So they, they, they made a mistake, and I thought to myself, you know, that's not my mistake. That's Amazon's mistake. The shoes were $43. They gave me $86. And in my mind, I'm thinking, what am I going to do here? This is, I don't want to have to make a phone call. I don't want to have to deal with this. I mean, does Amazon really need another $43? I know that God owns the universe, but sometimes it feels like Amazon owns the world. I mean, they're just taking over everything. I mean, 40, really, do I need to inconvenience myself to make sure they get that $43 back? See, it's just easier to not worry about that stuff. Verse 14 says this, for I'm afflicted all day long and punished every morning. This is his experience. This is what he's experiencing as he's trying to purify his heart and wash his hands in innocence. He's experiencing the reality that obedience is much more difficult in the moment. It's much more difficult in the moment to be honest with people. Isn't that true? Isn't it easier to just lie or just withhold facts or withhold details? It's much more difficult to serve people when you feel unappreciated by them or to parent your children the right way. You know, when you're trying to do the right thing, and your car breaks down, that's a frustra- that can be a frustrating experience because you start to think to yourself, if I didn't give as much money, I could have a nicer car. And if I had a nicer car, I wouldn't be stalled on the interstate. Do you see what I'm saying? So Asaph's experience is that I'm, doing, I'm trying to do the right thing, but my life is actually more difficult. Verse 16 says this, when I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless. So he's, in his own mind, he's trying to process what he's experiencing. He says, this just seems hopeless. He says, I see the puzzle pieces. I don't see how they go together. I see that there's some puzzle here, but I try to put them together, and they don't fit together. And he says, it's it's a hopeless experience for me. So it is a miserable experience to have significant doubts about significant things when you need to make a decision. The third thing about the nature of doubt is that doubt is moving Asaph in a direction. Doubt is moving Asaph in a direction. When you have doubts about the Lord Jesus Christ, when when you have significant doubts about who he is, what he's asking you to do, is it worth it to follow the Lord? Is this really the word of God? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Is Jesus alive right now? When you have these doubts in your soul, these doubts are going to move you in a direction. You're going to go one direction or another, but you you won't end up in the same place after your doubts have subsided. You're going to go one way or another. And this is what it says in verse 2. This is the direction Asaph's doubts are taking him. In verse 2 it says, But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. Here are the two phrases. First is, my feet almost slipped. Now in English, when I say my feet almost slipped, I think you kind of get what I'm saying. But that can mean a a whole variety of different things. And he certainly doesn't mean he almost physically fell down. And so when we look at this, it it doesn't have a crystal clear meaning to us. You know, honestly, when I read this, uh, my feet almost slipped. The first thing that came to my mind is I've fallen and I can't get up. That's what's going on in my mind. I need the pager button to push to get help. But I don't think this is what Asaph is talking about here. But he means something. And if you knew Hebrew, you would know what he's saying. It's much clearer. If you go back in time 3,000 years ago in the Hebrew culture, you would know what he's saying. And we, we kind of get it. It's a little bit more complicated, but if you're a Hebrew reader, you, you, you immediately know what he says. In English, when you say someone has fallen on the battlefield, they've fallen in battle, you know what that means. It means they died. And that term has stuck because in hand-to-hand combat, you get into hand-to-hand combat, and you slip, you fall, you're in trouble. You're probably dead. I mean, if you're actually in the battle, you fall down, you're in big trouble. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be dead, but you are losing. You are in a bad place. You are in a position of weakness, and you have made, you're, you're on your way to dying. So when he says, my feet almost slipped, he means I'm in big trouble. That the doubt in his soul is moving him into big trouble. My feet almost slipped. The second phrase is, my steps nearly went astray. This is a little more clear. It means... I'm close to walking away from the Lord. I'm close to walking away from the Lord. Many of you, if you've been following Christ for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 
you probably know a lot of people that you started following Christ with that are no longer walking with Christ, that their feet, their steps went astray. And he says, this is where I'm at, that, that the doubt in Asaph's soul is making him feel weak, it's putting him in a position of incredible vulnerability, and he says, I'm close to walking away from the Lord. So this is, this is where he is at. It is, a very, it is a very vulnerable place to be. And you need to understand that, that when it comes to following Christ, that long-term, unresolved doubts will push you away from the Lord. That, that's, that's what's going to happen. I'm not saying if you have a doubt for a day. That's not what I'm saying. But long-term, unresolved doubts will move your feet astray. They will push you astray. And many of you are pretty young. And if you think about following, when are we going to die? I don't know. How old are you going to be when you die? I don't know how old you'll be when you die. Let's say 88. I just made that up. Some of you, that means you have 40, 50, 60 70 years, and you think about the trajectory of walking with Christ, what I'm saying is that unresolved doubts, I'm not saying unresolved questions, because we will have questions until the day that we die about the Lord. Isn't that true? Don't you have questions, and you think, I don't know what the answer is to this question. I don't get it, but it's not not moving you away from the Lord. It's not disturbing your soul. You're just saying, I I just lack information here, but then there are certain, certain things that are in the Word of God that are pretty clear, and you look at those things in the Word of God, and you say, I don't know about that. I'm not convinced of that. You know, things like, is God really going to be good to me? Does God really love me? Does he really have my best interest in mind? Is it really worth the sacrifice? Is it really worth the difficulty? Is the Bible the very Word of God? If you look at that, you look at what the Bible claims, this is the very word of God, and you say, hmm, I don't know about that. I'm not saying for a day, but over the course of your life, your feet will go astray. They will go astray. That's what's going to happen. It's going to move you in that direction. The way I would describe this direction, there's kind of two parts of the same thing. But the first part is that Unresolved doubts prevent people from truly following Christ. It prevent, unresolved doubts prevent people from ever really following Jesus. If you're here this morning, and you look, let me ask you a question. Are you, are you really following Jesus wholeheartedly? Is he your life? Is he your joy? Is he your greatest treasure? If you, if you say, well, kind of, but I don't know. The reason is you have unresolved doubts in your heart. That's why. There's certain parts of the gospel, certain parts of the word of God, you just don't believe them, or you waver, I don't know, back and forth. And so, so what happens is that it prevents you from ever really following Christ, because you're not convinced. You're just not convinced. The other part of the direction, it's really the same thing, just on the different side, is that unresolved doubts tempt you to compromise. And this is where the danger is for most of us. Most, most of us here have had at least a season of our lives when we said, Christ is the greatest joy of my life. He is the greatest treasure of my life, and I'm going to obey him. I'm going to love him. I'm going to serve him with the rest of my life. But then you go through life, and life gets harder. You have kids, and you have a job. You don't know how things fit. And what is so easy, it is so easy for us to just hedge our bets, to hedge our bets in following Christ, You say, it's just so much more complicated now that I have a family. It's so much more complicated now that I have a mortgage. It's so much more complicated now that I'm in my 30s or 40s or 50s or whatever it is. And so what happens is you're not convinced of the worth of Christ anymore. Because you've you've seen that life gets hard and things aren't always easy. Things can be confusing and so you hedge your bets. So you still go to church but then you're just kind of living in the world. One foot in the world, getting all the pleasures of this life, and then one foot going to church, and you're just split. Because you don't feel comfortable rejecting Christ. Most of you, you probably wouldn't feel very comfortable saying, I don't believe Jesus lived, died, and rose again on my behalf. You wouldn't feel comfortable saying that, but you're not comfortable saying, he has my whole life. And so you split, you hedge your bets. 
It's like an airplane that climbs to 35,000 feet. Little doubts, or maybe big doubts, that don't get resolved over the course of time. It's like a little bomb in the engines that goes off. Boom. And you've lost your engine. Now you can just coast. You just coast. You can coast for a long time if you're at 35,000 feet. The problem is that you won't get to where you want to go. And so doubts can be very dangerous. This is the nature of doubt, which leads to number two, which is the reason we doubt. The reason we doubt. Do you ever ask yourself the question, why do I doubt? Why do I have doubts about the Lord? Why do I have doubts about the Word of God? Well, here's the answer. You are complicated. You are complicated. I am complicated. The human experience is complicated. When I was younger, I used to think it was much more simple. It's not. We are complicated creatures. And I have found this truth to be so refreshing and helpful when trying to love people who doubt. Because the Bible just assumes that there are here, people here this morning, who really love Christ, that, that are filled with God's Holy Spirit, but have significant doubts. That's, that's what the Bible just assumes, that many people over the course of their life, you, you think about how people grow and how people change. The Bible just assumes you're going to go through seasons of doubt. You're going, that's going to happen. Jude 1 says this, be merciful to those who doubt. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. In the Greek language, the word doubt, it means to hesitate. It means to waver. It means to go back and forth. It means you can't make up your mind. It means that you're indecisive. I heard someone say the other day, this is what they said. They said, I'm indecisive and impatient, so I don't know what I want, but I want it now. And I thought, that's right. Indecisive and impatient, so I don't know what I want, but I want it now. I heard someone else say, my decision-making skills closely resemble that of a squirrel when crossing the street. <laughs> you just go back, for yeah, I'm going to do it. No, 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 no. Uh, no, no, yeah, 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> and this is what happens. This is the human experience. And many of you, or I shouldn't say many of you, maybe some, maybe some of you have grown up in a church environment where it is completely unacceptable to bring up doubts that you have. You just have to pretend like you're just totally convinced of everything that the Bible says, of everything that God asks you to do. Because if you have doubts, that means you're a weak and worthless Christian. I think that's nonsense. I think the church should be the first place people come, not to spew heresy, that's not what I'm saying, But the church should be the first place people come when they have doubts. When they doubt, is this, am I looking at the very word of God? Where should they go? They should go to church. They should go to to the church where people love Christ. See, your your doubts, I don't know if you've ever, you you guys are all snowflakes. You're all special in, in every way. There's no doubt about that. But your doubts are not unique. Throughout 2,000 years of Christianity, people have had doubts. They're not unique doubts. And people who have gone before us have wrestled with all the doubts that you've wrestled with. And so it should be a place where we come to bring up our doubts, our questions. I don't, I don't get this. I don't understand this. How do we know God is really going to be good to us? But see, doubting happens because we're complicated, and the Bible anticipates that people who are going to follow Christ, that they're going to doubt. Now, in our culture today, I would say there is a giant lie about the nature of doubt when it comes to God, that our culture frames the conversation about doubts about the Bible, doubts about who God is. Our culture frames the conversation this way, by saying that The reason we don't really follow Jesus and trust the Word of God is that we have intellectual doubts. That the primary root issue as to why people are not all in for following Christ, trusting the Word of God, is that people have intellectual doubts. That there are arguments, 
reasons, science. This is why people cannot buy the Bible. This is why they don't give their lives to the Lord. And that is just plain nonsense. That is just nonsense. If you, if you think, you take a step back and you think, that is not what is going on. I'm not denying that there aren't legitimate questions that need to be answered before people will follow Christ. Of course, that is true. But that is not, that is not what is going on the majority of the time. And Psalm 73 gives us the anatomy of doubt, how doubt actually works. How does doubt, where does it come from and how does it work? And here are the three components that we see in Psalm 73. First is desires. Why do people doubt the word of God? Why do people doubt the person of Jesus Christ? Is it because there is no evidence for it? For Jesus being the son of God rising from the dead? Is it because there's no evidence that the word of God is the word of God? That's not, that's not the first level. The deeper level is that people have desires. And people instinctively understand that if I follow the God of the Bible, the God of the Bible is going to say, you can't indulge all of your desires. In fact, Jesus says, if anyone were to come after me, let him deny himself. That the word of God is going to contradict our natural desires. So this is the first factor. The second factor is that we have experience, or we have experiences, that we live life, and through living life, we, we look at the world, and there are things that, that make us wonder what in the world's going on. We don't have categories for those things. And then there's theology, either good theology or bad theology, and you put these three things together, desires plus experiences plus theology, good or bad theology, and it leaves you with unresolved questions. There, there are questions that you, you can't answer. But it's not like these unresolved questions just pop out of nowhere. These unresolved questions, they come out of our desires, they come out of our experiences, and they come out of our typically bad theology. Then from these unresolved questions come our doubts. So look at verse 13. Here's the unresolved question in Psalm 73. Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? Is it worth it? That's the question. That's the doubt. But how did he get here? Well, verse 3 tells us. He says, For I envied the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. In verse 3, he says, I envied the arrogant. What, what's, what is the foundation of the doubt? I love his honesty here. He says, I wanted what godless people have. That was his problem. I wanted what they had. I, I looked at the world and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That's what he says. Now, the word prosperity here is probably the only Hebrew word that most of us know. If you know a Hebrew word, it's probably this word. It is the word shalom. He says, I saw the shalom of the wicked. I saw the peace and the prosperity of the wicked. And God was stopping me from having it. I've been following the Lord and I haven't gotten the prosperity. Wicked people don't follow the Lord and they get the prosperity. And he says, what am I doing with my life? What am I doing with my life? And so this first part of verse 3 when he says, For I envied the arrogant, this is his desires, he had desires, and he felt like God was withholding things from him. The second part of verse 3, he says, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. This is a reference to an experience that he had, that he had an experience, and this experience is messing him up. Now let me ask you a question. What is the opposite of faith? What is the opposite of faith? Biblically, you will either walk by faith or by not faith. What is not faith? It is called sight. And sight is not the facts. That's not what it means. Some people say, well, when it says sight, it means the facts. It means reality. That's not what he's saying. The opposite of faith is not reason. The opposite of faith is not the facts. It's not logic. 
The opposite of faith is sight. I read an article this week in the, in the Wall Street Journal called Faith Versus Fact, Why Religion and Science Are Mutually Incompatible. And if you were to Google this, what you'll see is that there are a thousand articles like this. There are a thousand, a thousand different discussions about this. And the way the, the culture has set up the narrative is that faith is the opposite of facts. Faith is the opposite of reason. So there's reason, there's facts, there's logic, there's reality, and then there's this thing called the life of faith. And I would say that the majority of Christians that I have come into contact with throughout the years, they have bought that framework. They have bought the framework that the world has shoved down our throat, that it is faith versus fact, faith versus reason, faith versus logic. And I hear Christians say things like this. They'll say, faith isn't supposed to make sense. That's why it's called faith, duh. I mean, duh. And when I hear Christians say that, both of my eyes start to twitch uncontrollably. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, I think, no, 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 no. You can't do, you can't think that way. You're dead. You're dead because biblically, here's, the, this is, I'm not going to turn into a, uh, turn this into a sermon about faith here, but just, just a couple thoughts here. Biblically, biblical faith is consistent with logic, reason, and reality. And the way you exercise biblical faith and obedience is through your mind. You have to use your brain. You have to use your mind. That your choices, the life of faith is a life governed by your mind thinking through the word of God. And unbelief is the denial of logic. It is the denial of reason. It is the denial of reality. It is a misinterpretation of reality. And the basis of unbelief and disobedience is your desires and your experiences. And so what it means is this, is that if you don't live biblically, if you do not live a life of biblical faith, it is because you're living through your feelings. You just live according to your feelings. You live according to your experiences, that your choices aren't governed by the truth. They're just simply governed by your natural desires. That's what it means to walk by sight. You walk by faith or by sight? Do you walk do you use your mind or do you live according to your feelings? Do you do what the word of God says or do you do what seems right in your mind or in, in, your, in, in your own thinking here? Do you trust God's word or do you trust yourself? Do you trust your heart? And so in verse three, what Asaph says is this, is he says, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says, I had an experience and this experience messed me up. And so Asaph's faith is under attack, not by reason, not by logic, not by an argument, but it is under attack because he had an experience that he doesn't know how to process. He has an experience, he doesn't know how to process this. And all throughout the scriptures, if you want to see how people's faith is attacked, it's almost never attacked by reason, logic, or reality, the facts, and it is almost always attacked by an experience. Let me show this to you. I have like 30 examples. I'm going to give you a couple. The first one is Eve in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her, her husband who was with her and he ate it. And so Eve here, she's in the Garden of Eden is she attacked by reason or by logic? No, she is caught up in an experience. And I was thinking this week, what would it have been like for Eve to use her mind? Just think with me. What would it have been like for Eve to use her mind? She could have said something like this. I don't have parents. How do I explain my own existence? Where did I come from? I don't have parents. God actually directly made me, and I can talk with him. She could have said, I don't have a belly button because I didn't grow in a womb. Or maybe she did. I don't know, but whatever. There's a big debate there. Did Eve have a belly button? <laughs> or she could have said, why is this snake talking to me? Snakes don't talk. 
maybe something's up here. Or why, did, why didn't she say, this talking snake is saying something different than the God that we know, who created us, who, who walks with us? Maybe we should talk to him. See what he says. It's not what happened. She saw that the tree looked good. There was an appearance. And so she took the fruit and she gave it to her husband. And the world fell into sin. Or Joseph's brothers, Genesis 37. Joseph's brothers took Joseph and sold him into slavery, faked his death and sold him into slavery. Why did they do that? What, what was happening in them? Verse 3 says, Now Israel loved Joseph. Israel is Jacob. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him, and they could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. So what happened to his brothers? They had an experience, and the experience was our dad that we love loves Joseph more than us, and we don't know what to do with it. And they react. It was their natural desires mixed with this experience, and they react. They didn't use their mind. They react. Or Moses, Exodus chapter 2. Verse 11, years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, one of his people, looking all around and seeing no one. He struck the Egyptian dead and hit him in the sand. So he kills a guy. Why did he do it? He goes out and about, and he sees something. And he sees an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, and he says, that's not right, you're dead. Now, was this an exercise of his mind? Did he seek the Lord and ask the Lord what he would have him do? No. He had natural desires combined with an experience, and he reacts. Or David. 2 Samuel 11.2 says, One evening David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. And then he commits adultery and murder. Now, what happened? Well, his faith was under attack. But how is it being attacked? Is it reason? Is it logic? No. It is an experience. He had a powerful experience that drew him away from the Lord, that caused him to doubt the word of God, the goodness of God, and he turns away. And so when we see Asaph in Psalm 73, verse 3, this is what he says, For I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He says, I had an experience. I had an experience. Now, what was his experience? Well, in Asaph's mind, this is the way life was to unfold. Obedience and humility towards God equals life and blessing. Disobedience and pride equals death and destruction. You mock God, you're dead. You disobey God, you're going to have sicknesses, you're going to have tumors growing out of your head, I mean, you're going to be in big trouble. This is his framework. Disobedience and pride equals death and destruction. You're not going to have any friends, you're going to be poor, you won't experience the shalom of God. That was his framework, his incomplete theology. But it says, Asaph saw that people could sin and get away with it. That was his experience. That's what he saw. Verse 4, they, the wicked and the arrogant, they have an easy time until they die and their bodies are well fed. They are not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out from fatness. The, The imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to them and drink in their their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them, the wicked. They are always at ease, and they increase in their wealth. And so he's looking, and he sees these people in the world that mock God, that disobey God, that speak against heaven, and it says, 
their lives go well. They are at ease. They, they have friends. They have money. They're healthy. And I'm here trying to follow the Lord, and my life is more difficult. So he says, if people can sin and enjoy sin and get away with it, if people can sin and even mock God and life goes well for them and they experience all the pleasure and all the fun, they travel the world, they mock God and they have beautiful girlfriends. They mock God and they have great looking boyfriends. They mock God and they have nice cars. They mock God and they seem happy. Why in the world am I giving $43 back to Amazon? Do you see what he, this is what's going on. If, if they can get away with it, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? What am I doing with my life? I believe that the greatest threat to your faith will not be some argument that someone comes up with. The greatest threat to your faith in Christ will be an experience that you don't know how to process. You don't have categories for it. And it will attack the very fabric of your faith in Christ. Because what happens when you start to follow Christ is that either consciously or subconsciously, you develop a narrative for your life. You tell yourself a story about your future, about your, the future of your career, your ministry, your family, your family life, your friends, your church, whatever it is. You tell yourself a story about what the future will be like. But then after five years, 10 years, 15 years, you start to experience things that are not in your story. That's not part of the plan. Let me give you some potential examples. Maybe a pastor in your life, in your church, has a moral failure. This happens every day in America. And you think, I listened to that guy. He taught me so much. Can I even trust what he has to say? Or maybe you have some close friends that you've been walking with Christ. You've been walking together for years. And then they walk away from the Lord. And you think to yourself, we were going to be bachelors until the rapture. I mean, that's what, that was, we're going to do this together. We're going all the way until we see the Lord Jesus. Or maybe you have big time disappointments in your ministry or disappointments in your career. Or you find out that marriage and raising your kids is much harder than you thought. And you don't know how, how it all works. Or maybe you have significant health problems or your kids have significant health problems. You say, that's not part of my plan. Or maybe you're still single. You're 20, you're single, okay? It's going to work out. 25, and you're single. It's going to work out. 30, and you're single. 35, and you're single. And you think, I'm trying to honor God. I'm trying to put him first, but it's not working out. You think to yourself, Beyonce says, all you single ladies, put your hands up. And my hand is up. But no one is putting a ring on it. And so I don't know what to do with that. And you think to yourself, it's so much easier just to do what the world does with relationships. It's so much easier to do what the world does with their money and their life. And my life is harder because I'm following the Lord. I, I saw this video this week that I think just captures. It's really short, so you don't want to blink. But I saw this video that I think captures the experience that Asaph is having. He's, I'm going to ta- trust the Lord. I'm going to trust him. I'm going to do it his way. And then this is what they, or what he experiences. So don't blank. It's a short video. Lord, and close your eyes and just fall down, okay? Don't worry. Okay, then Lauren's going to catch you. Close your eyes. Okay. Okay, it's called the trust fall. Okay, trust fall. Ready, set, go. <laughs> <laughs> that's it I'm going to do this I'm going to trust I'm going to trust you I'm going to do it I know this is hard I'm going to do it and then you fall right on your face and I bet you you've had an experience like that you step out in faith and you're like no didn't, that's not what, what's supposed to happen okay so what do you do with your doubts then what do you do with your doubts This is normally the part in the sermon I would say come back next week. But we don't have a next week for the the psalm series. So I'm just going to quickly condense it down. One thing would be just read Psalm 73. You'll see it in here. But quickly, I'm going to give you three things. Number one, 
Asaph examined his doubts. With Asaph, he's aware of his doubts, his questions that he has, but there's a measure of skepticism about his doubts. There's a measure of skepticism, and there's there's a measure of incredible honesty. And if you can do this, most of your doubts will be dealt with. If you can do what Asaph does here, most of your doubts will be dealt with. Now, what does he do? Verse 3. Why am I doubting? Okay. For I envied the arrogant. What's my problem? I'm envious. That is incredible honesty. What's really going on is that I want things that other people have. And I feel like God is not giving them to me. So I don't think it's worth it. Psalm 84 says this, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. I love this verse because it says God is not, if you put the Lord first, you will always get God's best, always. I did not say if you put the Lord first, you will always get what you want. You will always get God's best, always. He does not withhold good from those who put him first. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is what the psalmist says. Just trust him. He's not withholding good from you. If you're, not, if you're here this morning, you're not really following Christ, the reason is because you think if you follow Christ, you will miss out on something. You don't believe Psalm 84. And so you gotta, you got to deal with this. Am I, am I missing out when I follow Christ? Is God withholding something from me? You gotta, he, this is what he's wrestling with, and he comes to a conclusion here, as we'll see. Number two, Asaph went to the sanctuary of God. What did he do? He went to the sanctuary of God. Verse 16, when I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their final destiny or their destiny. He says it seems hopeless. It was the, hopeless here. It seemed hopeless. It means it was trouble before my eyes. That's literally what it means. It was trouble before my eyes. I couldn't make sense of it. I looked at what I'm looking at, thinking about it. It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make a lick of sense to me. So he says, I have to get outside my own head. So I go to the sanctuary of God, where God's presence is at, God's people are at, and God's word is at. And he said, I needed to gain some perspective on my doubts. That's what you need to do. If you have doubts, you need to gain perspective on your doubts. Get before the Lord. Get with the people of God. Open up the word of God. And what he says is, the solution to the problem, this is what he needed to do. Are you ready? He needed to zoom out. He needed to zoom out. Then I understood their destiny. Now I saw the, I got with the people of God, I got with the word of God, I got in the presence of God. Now I see their destiny. And that changed everything. I see their destiny. You had to zoom out. See, sin only makes sense in that moment. Only in the moment. As soon as you zoom out, it makes no sense. And the further you zoom out away from your sin, the less and less sense it makes. And you know this to be true. You know, if I don't know where you're at, what you desire, what you want to do with your life, but a lot of people, they'll they'll see like a a nightclub setting or a bar setting, and there's good-looking guys, good-looking girls, and they're drinking alcohol, and they're flirting, and they think, oh, it's so appealing to me. It's so appealing to me. Oh, man, it's so appealing to me. And I think to myself, if you want to know whether or not this is a bad idea, you just need to zoom out about 10 hours. That's all you have to, just 10 hours. Just gain 10 hours of perspective on it. And talk to the people who just slept around with someone they don't know. Ask them how are they feeling. Just ask them that question, how are you feeling? Ask them where they're going to go get tested for an STD. Just zoom out 10 hours. And it doesn't make any sense. See, sin only makes sense in the moment. That's the only time it makes any sense. It's just in that very moment. You zoom out at all. The further and further you zoom out, the the less and less sense it makes. And sometimes obedience in the moment is so hard. 
But the further and further you zoom out from obedience, the more and more sense it makes. So he said, I, I had to get some perspective on my doubts. And that's what you need. You need God's eyes. You need God's thoughts. And we have his eyes and we have his thoughts in his word. Just go get with the word of God. Be with the people of God. Spend time alone with God. Bring your doubts to God. This is the turning point in the psalm. Until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their destiny. No more envy. No more envy. Okay, number three. We're almost done. Asaph came to a conclusion. Asaph came to a conclusion. And my heart is that you will come to the same conclusion that Asaph comes to. Verse 21. When I became embittered and my innermost being was wounded, I was stupid and didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal towards you. He says, I'm wrestling with my doubts, and you know what my problem is? I'm an unthinking animal. I'm just, I'm just going off of my basic instincts. I didn't understand. I was stupid. I was raging. I was mad. I was throwing a temper tantrum. I was an idiot. Verse 23, but then he realizes, realized something else. Yet, I am always with you. You hold me, or you hold my right hand. This is a picture of a dad as a kid is throwing a temper tantrum. And the kid having the temper tantrum zooms out from his temper temper tantrum and says, my dad was with me the whole time. My dad just held my hand and was patient with me. This is what Asaph's realizing, that even in your anger and frustration, the Lord doesn't abandon you. He tracks you down. Verse 24, you guide me with your counsel and afterwards you'll take me up in glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you certainly perish. You destroy all, the, all who are unfaithful to you. Here's the conclusion, verse 28. Just, just think, is this the conclusion of your heart? Here it is. But as for me, God's presence is my good. This is his conclusion. It's better to have God than everything else in the world. I have made the Lord my refuge so I can tell about all that you do. Asaph's blown away by the patience of God. He's blown away by the mercy of God. He's blown away by the love of God. And he says, but as for me, if I have God, I have everything. If I don't have God, I have nothing. And he says, that's it. That's it. And I hope that's what your heart is saying right now. And if your heart can't come to this conclusion, but as for me to have Christ, if I have Christ, I have everything. That Christ is my greatest joy. He is my greatest treasure. There are unresolved doubts in your heart that you need to deal with. So I would encourage you to deal with them. And if your heart says, no, this is what my heart says, Christ is my greatest joy, he's my greatest treasure, he is my highest good, then praise God. Praise God. This close. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to die in our place for our sins. And I, I just, I, I know there are a lot of people here today who are doubting whether or not it's worth it to follow you. And I just, I pray that you would help them to see that it is worth it to follow you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. If I have God, I have everything. If I have Christ, I have everything. If I don't have Christ, I have nothing. God, I pray that you would just do that here this morning through your spirit. That this truth would become a reality for each one of us by your grace. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.